we're going to go through a couple thought experiments to write down Newton's universal law of gravitation. And we'll start with this simple example here, a baseball player throwing a baseball. This is an example of all three laws at work. So as soon as he releases the baseball, it's moving for that moment in time anyway at a particular velocity, the velocity at which he released the baseball in a particular direction. And if there was no gravity and no atmosphere to cause frictional slowing down in the baseball, it would just continue off in that direction forever and ever by Newton's first law. But we have the second law at play as well. There is clearly a force here. It's a continuous force. It's the force of gravity. And it's represented in this figure by the downward arrows, the black arrows. It's continuous. It's constantly pulling that baseball in the downward direction. It's still moving forward at the same speed that he released in the forward direction, but its up motion has been slowed and slowed and slowed until it's actually reversed and the baseball is coming back down to Earth. And so there's a force here. It's the force of the Earth acting on the baseball is equal to the mass of the baseball times the acceleration of the baseball. And here's Newton's second law coming into play. But by Newton's third law, it says that there is an equal and opposite force. The force of the baseball acting on the Earth. And we never really think about that one. But it's the same as the force of the Earth acting on the baseball. It's given by the mass of the Earth times the acceleration of the Earth. Now, same force. We can call these two forces just plain old F because by Newton's third law, they're the same. The baseball is going to experience a bigger acceleration because it's mass is low. Low mass, big acceleration gives you the same force. But there's also the force of gravity of the baseball tugging on the earth. The earth wants to move up towards the baseball, but it's going to do so very, very slowly, very, very low acceleration because the mass is so huge. Take that force divided by the mass of earth, minor, minor, minor acceleration. So we don't notice the earth following after the baseball. But it's there. Those two forces are equal. Okay. So we know that the force of gravity is equal to this and it's equal to this. So we can start to put together an overall law. We know that the force is proportional to the mass of the baseball times the acceleration. And we'll come up with some quantity to describe the acceleration in a little bit. But we do know that it scales with the mass of the baseball. And we know that it also is proportional to the mass of the Earth. <coughs> So the force of gravity has to be proportional to both of them. Or, in general, if we have two bodies, body one and body two, force is proportional to m1 times m2. And this kind of makes sense. If we think about the Earth and something light on top of it, we don't think of the gravitational attraction to the, the lightweight thing like my pen here. But if you think of, think of binary stars, you have two stars, same mass, it's not just one being attracted to the other. The other is clearly just as attracted to the one. So this scales for all sorts of different mass combinations. There's something else that goes into gravity. What's the other important factor? The distance between the two masses. We all know intuitively if the masses are close together, it's going to be a stronger force. If they're far apart, it's going to be a weaker force. But, how did Newton figure that out? If you think about it, if you're talking about gravity, Newton is stuck here on the surface of the Earth. One Earth radius from the center of the Earth, and the force of gravity is what it is here. Now, he's thinking the farther up you go, the weaker it's going to get, but he can't himself get very far off the Earth. He can climb a tree, climb a building, but the force of gravity at the top of the tree is not much different than at the bottom of the tree. The difference is so small you can't measure it. The tree is tiny compared to one Earth radius. To really notice the change in force, you're going to have to go up another Earth radius or two. So up in a rocket. But Newton doesn't have rockets, so he had to be clever. He had to think it through. So there's a famous Gedanken experiment, that's German for thought experiment, called Newton's Cannon. Here it is. This is Newton's own figure. Imagine you have a really big mountain. Now, you got to really imagine, because mountains aren't that big. Uh, if you've ever messed with the globe before, and you feel over the surface, there are little bumps. That gives you an idea of the scale of mountains. Uh, they're not this big, but just, you know, pretend you had a mountain that big, and you hauled a cannon up to the top of it, and you fired the cannonball. If you fire with enough force, enough thrust, 
uh, the cannonball will land at the bottom of the mountain, point D. If you fire it with more force, it'll go farther. It'll land over maybe by point E. You can imagine even more force. It's going to go farther, farther, farther to point F. And even more, it'll go halfway around the world before it lands. Well, imagine firing it with enough force that it's falling, falling, falling at the same rate that the horizon of Earth is falling in front of it as it's traveling. Earth's curving, the path is curving, the curves are the same. So it falls and falls and falls and falls and falls, goes completely around and then falls and falls and falls and falls, and falls over and over and over again. It's constantly falling. And of course, the problem with doing this experiment in reality is air friction. The cannonball is uh, cutting through the atmosphere that's uh, robbing it of its energy. But if you ignore the atmosphere, or imagine a mountain so high it pokes above the atmosphere, it doesn't happen in reality, but you can imagine it, that, that cannonball will just keep going forever and ever. And so Newton said, well, wow, because that looks like an orbit. And for the first time in history, um, people thought of describing what happens in the heavens and the motions of uh, celestial bodies in the same way that we describe what goes on here down on the surface of Earth. Before that, everyone thought it was completely separate. You know, how the heavens work, that's one thing. The laws of nature down here on Earth, that's a totally different thing. Newton was the first to come up with the idea of universal law. I'll write it down, I'll come back to it in just a second. Let me just drive the point home. You can imagine if there were a taller mountain, you could start up here and fire the cannonball. And it would go around and around and around. And then taller mountain up here, and it would go around and around and around. Eventually you can keep imagining starting at a higher distance until you intersect the moon's orbit. And then it's clear it's the same thing. Now, falling in a gravitational field is the same thing as orbiting as long as you have the right speed such that you don't intersect with the Earth. So, universal law. We've talked about empirical law. That's what Kepler was doing. Uh, he looked at the motions of the planets in the sky and came up with a mathematical description. Not trying to explain why or how, it's just purely mathematical, that's empirical law. We talked about physical law, which is what Newton's engaged in, and the idea is you come up with underlying physical principles that govern not just what's uh, going on uh, for one particular thing, but for everything. Newton's laws of motion explain, uh, they're used in just about all calculations involving motion um, and forces, and you build buildings and bridges and anything, you're using Newton's laws. So underlying physical principles to explain complicated behavior. Now is a different idea, the concept of universal law. That the laws of nature that we deduce here on Earth apply everywhere in the universe. Again, as I was saying, people thought that the moon went around the Earth just because it did. No one ever envisioned it was responding to the same forces we have here on the ground. The reason that my pen falls when I drop it is the same reason that the moon is going around the Earth, the Earth is going around the sun. And you kind of have to... Uh, it's a bit of a leap of faith here because we can't get out to far reaches of the universe and perform experiments and confirm that the laws of nature are the same out there as they are here, but we have launched spacecraft and they've traveled uh, through the expanse of the solar system and everywhere we've gone, out beyond the Kuiper Belt, out beyond Pluto at this point with the Voyager spacecraft, the behavior of the spacecraft never changed. It's, it's always responding in accordance to the laws of nature's we understand them from our experimentation here on Earth. And astronomers, we look farther out, out beyond the solar system, and we not only take pretty pictures, but uh, you know, we examine the light very carefully, and we try to figure out what's going on physically, and we can explain what we see almost all the time. And the things that we haven't yet explained, we take more observations, and then we usually figure out. And it's an active field, uh, questions continually being answered, but we've never been stumped. We've always been able to apply the laws of physics as we understand them. And that's kind of a, a given thing. That would be your natural assumption that gravity you know, halfway across the observable universe works the same as it does here. We're just kind of brought up that way, but it was an ingenious idea at the time. And Newton was the first to come up with it. So, back to the problem at hand. He needs to figure out how gravity changes with distance and he can't get to higher altitudes himself, he did this thought experiment, realized that the orbits the planets around the sun, the orbits the moon around the earth, it's all the same thing. So now he's considering, instead of different heights above earth, let's do different heights above the sun. He has a number of objects to work with, all the planets are orbiting the sun. 
So if you can figure out how the force of gravity varies uh, from planet to planet, he already knows the distances, he can figure out how the force of gravity varies the distance. So that's what we're going to look at now. So let's start with the Earth. Here's the Earth going around the Sun, traveling on its circular orbit. There was no force of gravity. Given its current velocity, we would just speed off out into space along our current trajectory forever and ever. That's this red arrow here. But there is a force, there's gravity, that's the blue arrow constantly tugging us, pulling us back into this circular orbit. So, you can imagine, if we're traveling faster, it's going to take more force to keep us in a circular orbit. Okay, I'll just demonstrate that here with this ball. A ball uh, string. Now I'll start spinning it. Last time I did this, the ball came off and hit somebody. <laughs> but uh, it's traveling in a circle. It requires a force to keep it on the circular path. I know, I feel it in my finger. It's like pinching off the blood and fingers turn blue. Now if I go at a higher speed, and I certainly hope it doesn't break, uh, it takes much more force. I mean, I'm really feeling it hurts. My finger is about to fall off. So trust me, the greater the speed, the greater the force. If you're traveling faster, we know it's going to require greater force to keep you in that circular orbit. So Mercury must be experiencing a greater force to keep it in its orbit than Neptune to keep it in its orbit. Then all you have to do is make the connection between the speeds and the distances. Mercury is traveling fastest around the Sun. It's also closest to the Sun. Neptune, of the planets anyway, is traveling the slowest. It's the farthest. So the higher the speed, the lower the distance from the Sun, the smaller the distance from the Sun. And then you can infer that the closer you are to the Sun, the stronger the force of gravity is. And you just have to go and figure it out. We know the speeds, we know the distances. You put that together. When you first you figure out, and we'll do this in a little bit, what speed you have to travel to stay in a circular orbit, given the force of gravity. We'll figure that out. And then you just figure out how those speeds drop with distance by looking at the planetary data and put together and get force as a function of distance. And you can see the force on Mercury is the greatest. The units are arbitrary on the y-axis, scaled to the force required to keep Mercury in its orbit. It takes a little bit more than one-fourth the same force to keep Venus in its orbit, a little bit more than one-ninth to keep the Earth in its orbit, and so forth and so on. And it's a one over distance squared relationship. It could have been anything. Newton had to think through this, check the planetary data, and he realized that the force of gravity it's proportional to 1 over the distance squared. From the previous page, we have the force is proportional to the product of the masses. So you put it all together, you get the force of gravity is proportional to m1 times m2 over the distance squared. That's Newton's universal law of gravitation. Universal, because he's claiming it applies to everything, not just on the Earth, but can explain the motions of the planets themselves. Reading it out in words, it basically just says what I wrote in equation form. Every particle of matter in the universe attracts every other particle with a force that is directly proportional to the product of the masses, that's this, and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between their centers. So, again, here it is in equation form. In this form, it's written with the constant proportionality. If we see that proportional sign, what that means is the force is equal to some constant. We call that constant g since we're talking about gravity, m1, m2 over r squared. Newton's constant. I'll give you the value. You'll never need it in this class, but we can measure it. And it is 6.67 <coughs> times 10 to the minus 11 Newton meter squared over a kilogram squared. You'll never need it because we're not going to give you a problem where I say, suppose the mass of object 1 is 10 kilograms, and the mass of object 2 is thousand kilograms and the distance is this many meters, then you'd stick all that in there and you get the force in newtons. But, you know, we don't have a good feel for how much a newton is, and um, I won't ask questions like that. I might ask a question, in fact, on the homework, I do ask a question similar to this. What if the mass of the sun doubled? The force of gravity on the Earth would what? Double. 
What if the distance between the Earth and the Sun doubled? The force of gravity on the Earth would fall by a factor of four, because it's distance squared. Again, that's ratio astronomy. Uh, so, yeah, let's write out a little formula. You can see how you can do this formula, and then also you can do, start to do it intuitively. So the force, uh, let's say, after the universe changed, so let's say we have the mass of the Sun, and uh, suppose the mass of Earth got ten times bigger. And the distance between the Sun and the Earth doubled. I'm just making this up as I go. That's after the force before G M sun M E over R S E squared. That's the force of gravity between the sun and the earth now. Here's the force after the earth mysteriously. You no, know, what if the earth was just ten times more massive and twice as far from the sun? How would these forces compare? Formally, you take a ratio. The constants cancel. That's why you never need to use them. And what you get well, in this case, the masses of the sun cancel. And you get uh, 10 Me over Me divided by 2 Rse over Rse squared. This is just 10 over 2 squared, 10 fourths, 2.5. Okay, I've run off the side here. But there you go. I wasn't planning on doing that example, but with Kepler's laws, we did this. We, we wrote the equation out in one form and then another form, like the general case and the special case. Here's the after case and the before case. Not that the Earth would ever increase its mass by 10 times, but I'm just illustrating how you do ratio problems. And you don't have to do all that plug and chug. You just realize, yeah, the top would go up by 10, the bottom would go down by 4. And you told me that just by looking at the equation. So if you're having problems doing the ratios in your head, you can do this until you get good at it. But eventually you'll just be able to look at these equations and give me the answer. Maybe with a, a quick punch in the calculator, like 10 divided by 2 squared. Make sense?